Yeah, I'd like to begin on this conversation by just saying we are shaped actually by the uh, place that we were born in and also the times we were born in. I was born in 1925, just four years before the uh, collapse of Wall Street and the beginning of the Depression. So therefore, the climate in which I was born is one in which people were continually under pressure. It really affected lives of people, and especially in the neighborhood in which I was born, which is called Yorkville, and it's on the east side of New York City. Uh, one of the jobs I had in, uh, when I was 18, 17 and 18 was with Fred Waring and his Pennsylvanians, which was a, a very popular a band leader in the 1940s. And when I went to college, and I left New York City, and I worked very hard at f thinking about where I was going. I'm, and so therefore I made a decision to go to the College of Worcester in Ohio, which was really hard for our family at that time because I had graduated and I worked a little bit, but then I went to Worcester and I began to begin to reflect upon my own life. I would have to say that in um, College of Worcester is a great, great school. And the people who make it up mostly come from rural towns or suburban areas in Ohio. And for my particular point of view, suddenly to be shared, it was not something that they had experienced before. Why is it that the church doesn't seem to relate to working people very well? Okay, Even though that's where we began. So that began to be my focus. We were organizing chapters at this time called the Student League for Industrial Democracy. And when I came back to New York where its offices were, uh, and met the head of the adult uh, League of, uh, for Industrial Democracy, and that Minkoff, his name was, and he said he'd like me to work for the adult, for the what's called the Dress Joint Board, which was a couple of locals, the local 22 and local 67, in the garment district of New York City. And working that summer really convinced me of, of the importance of the trade union movement in getting justice for working people. Now, I decided that Union Seminary was my place to be because I not only was I a New Yorker, and uh, I also would be close to home, but, but I really did have a feeling that there needed to be some kind of a application of Christianity to the situations that we were facing in our society. Or during the World War II, both management and labor at that time, okay, agreed that they would not be in conflict, okay, there were not too many strikes during the 1940s because we had to win the war. That was the most important thing. So they ended up then, as in the Presbytery uh, structure, Presbyterian structure, of having a task force which put together management, labor, and the public, and they sat down and discussed what is going to be our future, and out of that came the idea that they would create a Presbyterian Institute of Industrial Relations in 1945 it got created. And out of that discussion it became obvious to me that there was a whole ministry that needed to be done in this new society that we're creating again after the war. In 1948, as I was also the the student leader in the Student League for Industrial Democracy. One of the liberal student groups was creating a tour to Saskatchewan in Canada. Well, Saskatchewan was being led now by a party called the, the uh, Cooperative Commonwealth Federation, CCF. It was really the first democratic socialist government in North America the beginning also in that province of the Canadian health system, which was the universal health system. I mean, this, these were just ordinary folks who just, and they were not ideological, they were just saying, what is, what, what's going to happen to us? We, we lived through this depression in the 1930s, and we lost so much in that. How are we going to provide justice for our people? About 1956, I began to think again about what about things going on overseas, the industrial development taking place in countries across the world? So I heard that there were a couple openings that were ha 
that were now in the, what was called the urban industrial field was just beginning in this particular period. And I talked to uh, then the person who was involved in looking at what possibilities were for this. And he said that you can either go to Japan or to the Philippines. We were accepted by the National Church, it was called the United Church of Christ in the Philippines. We began our work there in uh, 1957. But in 1958, this is one year later, they decided that they were going to try and put together an Asian conference, the first Asian conference on industrial evangelism. And we met in Manila, and 15 countries participated with their national leadership. They came together to talk about what was happening in Asia, from Seoul, Korea, all the way down to Australia, and including all the other Southeast Asian countries. And so we ended up having a, a, an office in the World Council of Churches, which therefore began to try and put together all the programs going on within the different world, regions of the world. So it really became a, a movement. It became a global movement of urban industrial mission. And by the time 72 rolled around, we ended up now, um, the, ch the Philippine church had really taken off on this and they had created their own leadership. So I, came, I had, a, had a request from Marshall Scott, who was now president, of McCormick Seminary to come, when I come back and head the old Presbyterian Institute of Industrial Relations, which I came back to do, but also at the same time, the Institute on the Church and Urban Industrial Society, which was an organization that was created virtually by mandate of the World Council of Churches, because they needed an information clearinghouse on all these ministries going on around the world. The Denominations decided to hold a meeting to create what they call the Federal Council of Churches in 1908. Now this was the gathering of these, what we would call mainline denominations coming together to carry out a common ministry. But at that 1908 meeting in Philadelphia, they had an initial speech was called the Church and Industry. So they already assumed that this was going to be a major issue, Church and Industry. The speech that was made by Frank Mason North, who also wrote, we Cross the Crowded Ways of Life, which is about the city. Okay? We Cross the Crowded Ways of Life. He included in it a, a little piece that talked about the conditions within our society, in that society in that day, and, and what has to happen in terms of where we need to work as churches. The Social Creed provided the groundwork for us. And when it came to the 1930s and the Depression, at the same time as Congress was passing the Wages and Hours Act, Social Security, workers' compensation for, for accidents, we were at the same time saying that within our General Assembly. We were backing up the Congress in a way we were being, uh, living our reformed faith into the society itself and saying this is, if we're going to be a Christian, a Christian denomination concerned with justice in our society, we were going to be supporting these, these things because it was a humane thing to do. It's not only uh, these issues, because I've also grown in my own understanding of what the issues are, because when you're dealing with the concerns of social justice and the welfare of people, all right, you've got to say the relationship of people who were gays and lesbians, a part of that scene, okay, and therefore I have been supportive of that whole thrust in society. Once you start really dealing with the question of justice, you know that you're going to shake up some people and that's going to be a problem, isn't it? In some cases we can't please everybody in our, where we are and some of our views of life. We're all part of the same universe. When I didn't know anything more than my New York experience. I thought New York was the world. As you step outside of that, you say, wow, there's a whole other boundary to explore here. And I felt part of my grandfather's movement saying, justice needs to be done to people in this world. Justice is the, thing, is the issue that we need to, to marginalize people. People should not be pushed down, but we should allow for people's creativity because everybody has some creativity within them to grow. Now, how do we allow for that creativity to happen for people to grow out beyond themselves in new ways? 
and new explorations. So I would say that's part of the movement of history. Each step of the way, you're part of history. What happened to me, and I remember this in my past experience, of the people being evicted and people living in squatter conditions, they called them Hoovervilles, Hoovervilles back in the 1930s, okay? And so suddenly I come to live in the Philippines and I see these people also trying to be routed out. I say, no, no, we can't let that happen. And as a Christian, I mean, how do we draw from our faith to this? And because you say people should not have to live like that. You've got to fight for justice in this world and see that people can live well or have at least a decent chance, a decent chance to live well. That's my view of history that I'm still part of that stream of history, even through my children. Okay.